inspiration really does come from so many different places. And for me, the inspiration came from my own butt. I did not like the way that my pants looked, I mean, excuse me, my butt looked in white pants. And like so many women, and probably every woman here in this room, I had clothing that hung in my closet unworn because I couldn't figure out what to wear under it. It looks great in the magazines, it looks great on the runway, but at the end of the day you get home and you go, now what? So let's face it, our options were not that great either. At, you know, what are we supposed to wear underneath these beautiful clothes? There were the shapers that were out there and those were dreadful. They were very binding and they all had these leg bands on the thigh that left a, a line or a bulge that you could see through our clothes. And then came the underwear, right? So that's another option, but that left a panty line. And then along came the thong, which still confuses me because all that did was put underwear exactly where we had been trying to get it out of. <laughs> So I took matters into my own hands and I actually cut the feet out of my own control top pantyhose. I threw them on under the white pants, I felt better, I looked more toned, slimmer, it smoothed out cellulite, it got rid of my panty lines, but they rolled up my legs all night. And I remember thinking, you know, I have got to figure out a way to comfortably keep this down on the leg. If I can find a way to keep this just below the knee, there won't be any line or mark on the woman's thigh. It'll look invisible under clothes, but it'll be lightweight enough that we'll want to wear it under everything, even beautiful slacks. So that was the exact moment and what you know, caused me to cut the feet out. But on my journey of getting this made, it, it dawned on me very quickly, I was talking to almost only men. And I kept thinking to myself, where are the women? And then it dawned on me, okay, so maybe this is why our pantyhose and our shapers have been so uncomfortable for so long, right? <laughs> because the people making them were not spending all day in them. And if they were, they certainly weren't admitting it, so. <laughs> So I started the process, and um, at the time, I'll paint the picture a little bit about where I was in my life. I'd only really had two jobs since college. I basically bombed the, um, entr the LSAT. I wanted to be a lawyer, and I didn't do well on that test twice. So I tried out, I went to Disney World, and I tried out to be goofy. Um, <laughs> but you have to be 5'8 in order to be goofy, and I'm only 5'6, so they made me a chipmunk. And, um, <clears throat> That was a real high point. Um, so I did that for about three months, worked at Disney World, and then I ended up selling fax machines door to door for seven years until I cut the feet out of my pantyhose. I had never taken a business class. I'd never worked in fashion or retail. And I had $5,000 in savings. I just moved out of my mother's house. I was 27 years old, and I was probably dating a loser at the time. So there you have it. <laughs> There I was, and I you know, wanted to wear these pants. I didn't know where to go, so I decided, I've got to get this made. I went on the internet, and I started looking up hosiery mills. And I went to a website called thomasregistry.com, which lists all manufacturers in the United States. Now it's called thomas.net. But they listed it for me, and lucky for me, most of the hosiery manufacturers are in North Carolina. Well, I was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. So I started picking up the phone and calling all these manufacturers and introducing myself over the phone. And I, I just, I A, couldn't get the right person on the phone. People kept transferring me around. I mean, I imagine on the other end of the line them saying, you know, here, there's a girl on the line, so she's going to transform her own butt. Like, wh who, which department am I supposed to send her to? <laughs> Everyone kept either hanging up on me saying, no thanks, it's not a good idea. So I believed in my own idea enough, though, that I realized, okay, I want to patent this. I may be having some difficulty right now getting someone to help me make the idea, but I want to protect it. So I went and looked up on the internet Martindale Hubble, which is a website that lists attorneys, and they will tell you the ranking and you know, sort of the rating next to them. I started looking for a female patent attorney in the state of Georgia, and I couldn't find one. So I called the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, 
and I introduced myself, said I'm looking for a female patent attorney, and they told me that there actually was not a female patent attorney in the state of Georgia at the time. So I said, okay, I gotta, I'm gonna go describe this to a man and we'll see what happens. And I went on the website, I picked three different law firms. I cold called each law firm. I put on my nicest suit from selling fax machines that I had. I had my lucky red backpack that was with me the entire journey of Spanx. And I went and met with them. Well, they all quoted me between three and $5,000 to patent it. And I had $5,000 set aside in my savings to do this. So I decided to patent it myself. Well, the attorney that ended up helping me at the very end of this process, he admitted to me that when I came to him with the idea that he thought my idea was so bad when I met with him, that he actually thought I had been sent by Candid Camera. <laughs> which completely makes perfect sense because I was, as I was sitting in the room explaining it to him, he kept looking around the room and he later said to me, <laughs> he said, Sarah, I really have to tell you, I either thought you were sent by Candid Camera or that I was being pranked by some of my guy friends because you, know, you whipped out the pantyhose, you're showing me the, the crotch and where you cut these and how you're gonna change the world. And he's like, I wasn't used to that. So uh, I ended up going and buying a book called Patents and Trademarks at Barnes & Noble on Peachtree Road in Atlanta. And I started writing my own patent. I wrote the background. My mom did the sketch of the drawing that's still in the patent right now. And it was me standing in our living room in the prototype. <laughs> and so I was in the process of getting this made. And when I got to the end of it, there's the claims portion. Well, I have no idea how to write the real legal part of it, so I knew I was going to need the attorney's help at some point for that portion of it. At the same time, I decided I'm going to try to make this prototype myself. So I started driving around and going to fabric stores. I started going to Michaels and Hancock Fabric. I was duct taping pieces of lace at the bottom of the, the pantyhose. I was paper clipping little stretchy things to it to try to create my own version. And just from my cold calling days, I realized I've got to go in person to these mills. They need to meet me. <laughs> they keep hanging up on me, but I have to go there in person. So I took a week off of work from selling fax machines at Danka. And I drove around North Carolina, and I went door to door to all the manufacturers that I'd been calling on the phone. Well, I would go in, and they would always ask me the same three questions, which was, and you are? And I'd say, Sarah Blakely. <laughs> and they'd say, and you're with? <laughs> I'd look around, I'd go, Sarah Blakely. <laughs> And they'd say, and you're financially backed by? And I'd say, Sarah Blakely. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so nice to meet you, Sarah Blakely, but we're not interested. They all escorted me out, and I didn't have any luck on that road trip. But what happened was, two weeks after I drove around North Carolina in person, I actually got a phone call from one of the manufacturers in North Carolina, Sam Kaplan, in Charlotte. And he said, I quote, Sarah, I have decided to help make your crazy idea. <laughs> and when I asked him why he had the change of heart, he simply said, I have two daughters. <laughs> so he had run the idea by his daughters. They said, it's brilliant, Dad. Help this girl make it. And he, we set out to make it. So the process of me cutting the feet out of my pantyhose while trying to get the prototype made before I launched it was two years. So there was a, a year solid of me driving in North Carolina on the weekends and at night or taking time off from work to go and work on the prototype, get it made. I learned so many things that I didn't know as a consumer, it had never dawned on me, you know, that men were making all of our undergarments. So I learned very quickly that the industry had been taking an average waistband size between a small and an extra large and putting the same waistband on every pair. <laughs> exactly, that's what I said. I said, you know, that's not working. <laughs> we're really uncomfortable. And they were doing it to cut cost in production. So I immediately changed that. In a Spanx waistband, a size small gets a small, medium gets a medium, and so on. Makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> 
I also realized that they had been putting a tiny rubber cord inside the waistbands that had been there forever. Well, we had made so many advancements in yarns that they no longer needed the rubber cord, but no one had stopped to say, do we still need to put this? So I immediately took the rubber cord out of it. And another thing I learned was the way that they were doing sizing was just so, blew me away. They would figure out a size by putting them on plastic forms. <laughs> And they would all put it on a plastic form. They had different size forms. And they would stand back with their clipboards and go, yep, that's a size medium. <laughs> and I'd lean in and I'd go, ask her how she feels. <laughs> <laughs> so at Spanx, we put our product on women. My mother, my grandmother, who's 90, my sister-in-law, Cassie. I mean, all of my friends, the girls at Spanx, we're testing it on real women. And we want to test it more than two seconds to say, yep, that looks like a medium. We, we have people wear it for a week, wash it, tell us if it rolled, did it move, did it stay in place, how did you feel? Very concerned with Spanx garments and how they made you feel. So in making the garment, getting the process done, I revisit the patent, I get the, the prototype finally exactly where I want it, and I call the attorney back up and I said, okay, I'm ready, please help me write the claims portion. And I basically beat this guy down. I think he felt sorry for me. He said, I'm going to write the claims over the weekend for $700. I said, great, I'll take it. And he wrote the claims, but he called me on Monday and he said, Sarah, in doing this, it dawned on me, I don't know a lot of the technicalities of this garment. Can you please um, you know, get me in touch with somebody at the mill you've been working with so we can discuss yarns? I said, no problem. So I called Ted. Well. Ted was someone that I had really become close friends with in the back of the hosiery mill for the last year. Now, if I could describe Ted to you, he was Southern. And when I say Southern, I mean real Southern. <laughs> real Southern. So I get on the phone to a conference call. Ted, hi, this is my attorney. Can you guys all talk and let's talk about what's in this product? He said, sure. And he goes, well, they're 70% nylon and 30% lacquer. <laughs> OK, great, thanks. I'm writing. I'm taking notes. I'm, I'm my attorney. I'm like, got it, great, OK. The night before I'm about to submit this to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I cannot sleep. All night, I'm up, and I'm thinking to myself, how is there lacquer in this product? <laughs> So I called Ted. I said, Ted, it's Sarah. Can you please spell lacquer? He's like, yeah. L-Y-C-R-A. <laughs> oh my god. OK, Lycra. Got it. That makes so much more sense. <laughs> so. So I call my attorney. I said, do an all change on lacquer. It's lycra. And he started laughing so hard. He goes, Sarah, do you know how fast you would have gotten a patent on trying to make this out of paint thinner? Like, <laughs> OK, so I've written the patent. I'm submitting it. I have the prototype. I'm getting it almost perfect to where I want it to be. i got to come up with a name. So I had been writing down on scrap pieces of paper for that entire year really bad names. In my car, on a plane, you know, pulling off the side of the road. And finally, I narrowed down my thinking on what I wanted to name my invention by this. I, I recognized that the two most recognized names in the world at the time were Kodak and Coca-Cola. So I started playing with them in my mind. Why are they the two most recognized names in the world? What do they have in common? And they both have a significant K sound to them. And I actually had read that the man who started Kodak liked the K sound so much that he put the K in the beginning and the end of the word and started playing with letters in the alphabet to come up with the word Kodak. I also knew that you know, Coca-Cola had such a strong case presence to it. And I have a bunch of friends that are stand-up comedians, and it's this, just this weird trade secret among comedians that the K sound will make your audience laugh. So it was determined. For good luck, my invention was going to have the K sound in it. And I added it. I, I decided, OK, once I decided that, I was clearer on my thinking for the name. 
it came to me while sitting in traffic in Atlanta. I got very lucky. I was sitting there, and just the word Spanx came across the dashboard. And at the very last second, I went home, and I, I knew it was right and I changed the KS to an X at the last minute because I had done research that made up words do better for products than real words do, and they're also easier to trademark. I didn't tell one person the name. I got on USPTO.gov, which stands for United States Patent and Trademark Office.gov, which was my best friend at the time. I was always on that website. I did a search. I entered my credit card, and for, I think, $250 or $300, I hit send, and I owned the name Spanx. A month later, I got it in the mail. <laughs> I didn't even know that people spent millions of dollars trying to name things and that they had big groups talking about it. I didn't even know that at the time. And then I decided, OK, well, I'm going to be a business I need to incorporate. So I went to incorporate.com. And I put in my credit card, and I think it was like $150 at the time. And I remember looking at the options. I'm like, LLC, never heard of it. <laughs> Subclass or C Corp, never really heard of it. S Corp, OK, S Corp, my name starts with an S. I'll give the, let me try this one out. <laughs> I ended up reading about S Corp, and it made the most sense for me. But I was, that's how I got narrowed it down to the S Corp. So I hit, OK, S Corp, hit send, and then I was incorporated. The packaging. What am I going to do for the packaging? I knew, I thought as a consumer, I didn't know anything else. I'd never actually taken a marketing class either in my life. But I knew as a consumer, I was frustrated. I was going into the hosiery departments, and everything looked the same. It was the same beige package or the same white package with the same half-naked woman that had been on there for 30 years. And I couldn't tell what I was buying. So I said to myself, I'm going to do this different. I want it to be my favorite color red. No one had ever done red in the hosiery space before. I wanted to be bold, stand out. I knew that if I got a chance to be on the shelf with no money to advertise, it had to jump out and say, I'm new, I'm different, try me. So I put three animated, illustrated cartoon women on the package, which had also never been done before. There had only ever been photography on these hosiery packages. I was working on it every night after work on my friend's computer. She had just finished. Um, graphic design school. So I would come home, and we would sit side by side. And I was cutting out lips and eyes. And I was very you know, excited about how to make it design-wise. I wanted it to feel like you were buying a present for yourself instead of a commodity that we dreaded. Well, as soon as I got the package exactly where I wanted it to be, I remember having this moment where I thought, maybe there's supposed to be something on this package for legal reasons. So I went to the store, and I bought 10 different brands of pantyhose, and I put them all on the floor of my apartment. And I remember looking, and if the same thing was on all 10, I was like, must be legal. <laughs> so I added it. <laughs> So here I have the, the packaging. I love it. I have the product. I put it in a Ziploc bag from my kitchen. I've got my lucky red backpack. i got to go sell this thing. I call Neiman Marcus around the corner of my apartment in Atlanta, and I said, hi, this is Sarah. I've got a product I want to come show you. And the lady kind of laughed and said, well, we have a buying office, <laughs> and that's in Dallas. I said, oh, OK. So I hung up, and I called and called the buyer. And from my cold calling days, I knew I'm not going to leave a message. I'm going to keep calling until this woman answers the phone. So the second she answered the phone, I took a very deep breath. I was so scared. And I said, hi, this is Sarah Blakely. And I've invented something that's going to completely change the way all of your customers wear clothes. And I'll fly to see you if you'll give me five minutes. And she just kind of took a pause. And she goes, well, where do you live? I said, Atlanta. She goes, all right. If you're willing to fly here, I'll give you 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Great. So I jumped on a plane, and I went to the Neiman Marcus headquarters. Before I went, I was, you know, my few friends, I had my lucky red backpack. They stopped me in my tracks. I had my closest friends, they go, Sarah, please. They were pleading with me, please don't bring that red backpack to the Neiman Marcus headquarters. I mean, this was my old backpack from college. It was dirty and, you know. They said, do anything. You can't bring that red backpack. I mean, if you need to, go buy a Prada bag. Return it the next day. I mean, whatever you need to do. But don't bring that red backpack. Well, 
I took a very deep breath. I said, you know what, this is my good luck charm. I gotta bring it. So there off I went with the Ziploc bag in the, pa the backpack, the color copy of the packaging. I went to the Neiman Marcus headquarters. I'm sitting in front of this buyer that was the most impeccably dressed woman I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, even her pen matched her outfit. I was just, <laughs> and I was shaking. I had my red backpack on the floor and I started going into my spiel and I, was, I knew I wasn't really making a ton of sense. And so halfway through it, I go, you know what? You just have to come with me to the bathroom. <laughs> She's like, excuse me? I go, I know, I know, it's a little weird, but just please come with me to the bathroom. I'm going to do my own before and after for you, and then you'll get it. So we walk down the hallway, I mean, in total silence. I'm like, I can't believe this. I go into the stall. I have on the white pants that caused me to invent it. I come out with the Spanx on. I turn around. I had just shown her what it looked like without the Spanx on, and she took a step back, and she goes, I get it. <laughs> and then she goes, it's brilliant. <laughs> and then she said, I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to put you in seven stores. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> that drive from the Neiman Marcus headquarters to the airport may have been one of the greatest drives and moments in my life. I was driving, and I was just beside myself. I called Sam from the hosiery mill. First call I made. Sam, Sam, it's Sarah. I need more Spanx. It's like, excuse me, what? Slow down. What's going on? I said, I just landed Neiman Marcus. Total silence. <laughs> excuse me? I just landed Neiman Marcus. They love my product. I need more. He's like, more of that Spanx thing you cre invent? That thing that we've been making for you? Yes, that thing, Sam. Total silence. Sarah, don't take this the wrong way but I thought you were going to be giving these away as Christmas gifts for the next five years. <laughs> I said, no, Sam, they love it. They want more. And he was just, wow, congratulations. This is unbelievable. Let me patch you through to Ted. <laughs> Patches me through to Ted. Ted, Ted, it's Sarah. I need more. Well, that's great. But what you going to do about the crotches? Excuse me? Don't they come with crotches? We've been making them with crotches. <laughs> well, yeah, but we only got two crotch machines, and they're being used by somebody else. <laughs> OK, let me get this straight. I have just landed Neiman Marcus, and I have no crotches. <laughs> go for a crotch. I mean, <laughs> I looked in the yellow pages <laughs> under crotch. <laughs> it's not there. <sighs> so I realized that there was a fancy word for crotch. It's called a gusset. <clears throat> so <laughs> that helped me on my search for the right, the right crotch. So my roommate at the time, I started calling companies all around the world. They were FedExing them to me all the time in our apartment. My roommate would come home from work and hold the FedEx package up and be like, got another crotch in the mail. <laughs> I'd hold it up. It looks good to me. I don't really know. So luckily for me, I found a gusset company 20 minutes north of my apartment in Atlanta in Norcross, Georgia. And just to make the story just even that much better, when I walked in, an 80-year-old man who'd been in the business forever, he was apparently a crotch legend. <laughs> His name was Gene Bobo. And Gene Bobo came out, and I'm hyperventilating. Basically. I'm like, I'm landing Neiman Marcus. I invented this thing. And, I, and, and, and he's like, I have your crotches. <laughs> So he saved the day. He truly did. He provided me them, them right away, sent them to the mill, and we were able to use them in the garment in order to place the order. Well, I, my chance was seven stores. So what did I do? I immediately called anybody I had remotely ever known in my life in those seven cities. And it went kind of like this. Hi, this is Sarah. Remember me? We sat next to each other in fourth grade? Right. <laughs> yes, that's me. 
Um, can you please go into Neiman Marcus and buy this product called Spanx and act like you've been looking for it your entire life and I'll mail you a check? <laughs> and I literally did that. As soon as I was running out of friends and money, the Oprah Winfrey Show called. So. <laughs> Nothing's better for an entrepreneur with no money to advertise than getting that phone call. I had sent a gift basket to her with a note saying, you know, she was an inspiration and, um, you know, I hope that she liked my product. And her, uh, the man that dressed her for so many years, Andre, put them on her right away and she fell in love with them and basically has been wearing them almost every day since that day. And I got the call that Sarah, Oprah has ch chosen your product as one of her favorite products of the year. And she doesn't ever have a person on this show. It's always all about the product. But she heard that you are sort of, she heard a little bit about your story and how you're taking on the male-dominated hosiery industry and doing it out of your apartment. And so she wants to roll a little clip about what you're doing and who you are. So we're going to fly down to Atlanta. I said, that's fantastic. They said, we're going to be there in two weeks. You have a website, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> I turned to my boyfriend at the time, Dave, who was a healthcare consultant. I'm like, build me a website. He's like, I'm a healthcare consultant. I'm like, please, build me a website. He's like, OK, I'll figure it out. So the two of us went on bigstep.com, which no longer exists, and we scanned in the color copy of the packaging. And that was the home page of my website for, two, for a year and a half. And it cost me $18 a month to run my online business for the merchant account. So, the Oprah Winfrey Show, they show up at my apartment, very official, clipboards, big cameras, notebooks, very professional looking people. And the first thing they said is, Sarah, we discussed it on the plane. We want to film you in your headquarters. <laughs> I said, you're here. <laughs> And this person kind of gained their composure, looked at the other and they go, oh, OK. Well, and we also discussed that we want to film you having a staff meeting. <laughs> Hold on a minute. So I called Connie that I had met at mailboxes, et cetera. <laughs> I said, Connie, it's Sarah. Can you be at my apartment in like five minutes and look like you work for me? She goes, I'm on my way. And then I called several of my close friends. They all left their jobs, raced over to my house, and we sat on the floor of my apartment in a circle. And that was the staff meeting on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> so where do you go? I had just landed Oprah. I had this product. I felt that it, it was, uh, you know, I was on to something. I needed to build a, a team. I needed some help. So my boyfriend, who was the healthcare consultant, he left his job and he started helping me do all the fulfillment. He said, "You got, you, you know, I'd send my trucks pulling up twice a week to my apartment in Atlanta, and um, I was doing all the shipping at night." And he really started helping me do the fulfillment. And we were in the back room. We we ended. I ended up starting the headquarters in my best friend's bedroom. She had moved out, and. <laughs> I, we set up two cardboard tables in the beginning, and people used to call and say, I need to speak to shipping and handling. <laughs> and we'd always say, please hold while I transfer you. <laughs> then, I, then, I, <laughs> then I went for a walk with a friend to get a bagel, and I'd given her one of my prototypes, and the entire walk to get the bagel, she, all she did was tell me how much she loved it. By the end of the walk, I looked at her and I said, do you want to be my head of PR? She's like, well, I don't know anything about PR. I go, I don't either. I've been calling these radio stations and magazines and circling people's names and newspapers. And I think you could do it just as good as I could, if not better. You seem to really love the product. So she immediately came on board and started doing that. And then the third person that joined my team was someone that I was looking for an assistant. Because at that time, I was doing everything and also trying to coordinate my travel. And it just got so crazy so quickly. So this woman, Jadidia, who had been an interior designer, came on board to be my assistant. And after two weeks in my apartment, I came home one day. And I looked at her and I said, do you want to be my head of product development? <laughs> she looked at me and she goes, I don't know anything about pantyhose or shapers. I go, I don't either. <laughs> It's perfect. So she actually did become my head of product development, and she's still with the company today, 12 years later. And let me tell you something. 
She's unbelievable. She has this special gift because she thinks so far out of the box. She'd never done it before. And the two of us together coming up with ideas and really trying to push the hosiery mill way outside of their comfort zone is a, a huge reason why the products that you so love and enjoy that you have today. And now the product development team has grown obviously beyond, beyond her and they all think so far out of the box. That's why we want to keep bringing you such innovative ideas and products. So I had assembled my team and literally from that moment, I, said, I turned to them and I said, I'll see you later. And I basically left for two years. <laughs> I was on the road every single day for the next two years standing in stores promoting Spanx. I would always you know, jump back, go back to the headquarters. I was always calling back and checking in. And they were trying to call as many outlets as they could to continue to do it. But I cold called Neiman, Sachs, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's. QVC, I was out on the road, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake, they think once you get the order, you're golden, and that couldn't be any farther from the truth. Once you get the order, that's when the real work starts. I was absolutely determined to ensure my own success, and I think that's what it takes. I didn't want my success to be contingent on anyone else having to sell this. So I hit the ground running, and I went from department store to department store, and I would do morning rallies at the store where I would gather people around. Well, the store manager said, Sarah, you know, you can do it with the hosiery associates. Well, I'd travel all the way to Arizona, and there'd be three hosiery associates. So I quickly was like, I got to get the whole store at this morning rally. So I would go into the entrance before the store opened, like a Neiman's or a Saks or a Bloomingdale's, and I would run around and introduce myself to every employee setting up their station. I'd say, hi, I'm Sarah. And I would try to convince them that it would be worth their time to come see my morning meeting. And I got everybody there. I had taken the Oprah clip and the a little bit of local press I'd, I'd received and put it on a video and did that in my morning rally. And it was such an important thing that I was doing. I inadvertently was building a sales force that wasn't on my payroll. And they, all across the country, became my biggest advocates for the product and started selling it on behalf of Spanx and me. But another thing I learned, and as an entrepreneur, you learn your obstacles very quickly by being in the space. They come at you, and they become very clear. I realized I have to get this product out of the hosiery department. It's, it's hosiery, yes, but the woman who's buying this is not going into the hosiery department. And it's, by the way, the sleepiest corner of the store. And not only that, so you all say, yes, you know. Not only that, they gave me one pocket. I didn't even get a row. I got a pocket. And I'll never forget when I got the pocket and the first day it shipped to the first Neiman Marcus, I went in by myself. I stood there like this. I saw my product that I just created on my home computer with my friend between Donna Karen and Calvin Klein. And I saw Spanx. And I literally just big tears started going. I was just like, I cannot believe this. So I was so excited. I've got to make this work. I feel like if I didn't go to the stores and really make this happen on the ground level, that my product, as great as it is, would have shipped to the store and six months later been shipped back to me. So I, I was running around and doing everything I could to get it out of the store. And two things that I did, I realized, OK, what can I do? So I went to Target. And I bought Target stands that you buy in the office equipment aisle. And I put them at every register in Neiman Marcus with some Spanx in it. Well, can you imagine? I mean, Neiman Marcus is so impeccably designed. And their visual team is so unbelievable. But I started getting away with it because everybody thought somebody else approved it. <laughs> So I'd just walk up to a register and I'd put it right there while the lady was ringing up a beautifully dressed woman and throw my three spanks in there and be like, okay, yep, it's approved. And what happened was by the time that Neiman Marcus caught on that no one had approved this, <laughs> the CEO of Neiman Marcus, Bert Tansky, um, said, whatever this girl's doing, let her keep doing it. Because he had never seen so much volume off of a $20 item. So I got the approval after the fact on that one. But another time, in my one pocket, it was in Atlanta, Georgia, they moved my pocket. I went in. I was always in the store every other day to check on things. And they had moved my pocket in a place in the department where I couldn't, you couldn't see it anymore from the escalator. And that was my big shot, that some woman would maybe see it and be drawn into the department. So I pulled up my car. I jumped out. I had a Lucite bin with two compartments, a clear bin that held pantyhose that I had bought at some container store. I ran into Neiman Marcus. I had duct tape. I threw it on top of the register in the hosiery department. I duct taped it as fast as I could, and I sprinted out of the store. <laughs> well, 
This woman, an associate that I'd become friends with, she called me the next day. She goes, Sarah, we need to talk. I said, why, what's up? She goes, well, they have you on surveillance video. Um, <laughs> Okay, yep, all right, so I'll talk to the store manager. I mean, the store manager's like, you know, you could get arrested for this. I mean, what were you thinking? I said, look, please, just, you move my pocket, and he finally said, I'll put the pocket back. I'll give the hosiery team the direction to move your pocket back. So that's kind of what I was doing the whole process, and I'm driving around the country all day long every day, and when Spanx started, I gotta set the stage a little bit for you, there were no self, there were no, uh, excuse me, Blackberries. No one had ever heard of an iPhone or an iPod before. I mean, the Kardashians were in like the fifth grade. <laughs> and MapQuest was just getting started, so half the time I was on my, the computer in the hotel that I was staying at and trying to MapQuest my next location, and it, it was a really crazy time. As I'm driving all around, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, Actually, I, I remember this one time in Chicago. I had spent so much time alone on the road. I did an event at the Neiman Marcus outside of Evanston, I believe it was, at, in Oak Brook or North Brook. And I spent the whole day promoting lifting up my pant leg and turning and shaking my butt for everyone in the entrance. And that's, uh, you know, I'd been setting up these tables and moving them farther and farther out of the hosiery department to the point where they were in the entrance of Neiman Marcus. I mean, people would walk in, I'd go, hi, I'm Sarah. And I would flash them my butt. And, you know, I was trying everything. I put donuts on the table. I was like, have a donut and some Spanx. <laughs> um, and so when I got in this uh, taxi that I had called at the end of that event, and I was driving, I was maybe 15 minutes into the cab ride, it was a 35 minute cab ride, I was completely fried, I'd been talking to people all day, I was reading my book out of my red backpack, the cab driver and I had not said one word to each other, I'm reading, reading, after like 15 minutes I hear this voice, he goes, do you want to go to dinner? <laughs> I looked up, I go, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just remember saying, but will you turn the meter off while we eat? And he goes, sure. <laughs> So he was from Lebanon. He took me to a Lebanese restaurant. It was fantastic. I was so happy to have someone to talk to rather than room service. And then I went back home. So two years of this on the road and, and sweating it out. But the things that on this journey that I feel like most made the biggest impact for me was the first thing is you've got to differentiate yourself. I always ask myself, why am I different? How am I different? And I, I think it's very important to be I, I call them the three C's, but clear, concise, and confident. You have to be able to describe it in a minute or less. Make it so clear. The customer really wants to make smart decisions, and they really want us to make it easy for them. So I always say, make somebody feel the pain, or if it's not the pain, uh, which means the problem on why you did what you did or why you're creating what you create, then explain to them your uniqueness. And then right after that, you've got to give them the solution very quickly, and then take it through and say why you're the best. I mean, very quickly, explain to them in just a few seconds why you're the best option. And I find that very, very helpful. So in everything I do, I ask myself, why am I different? I also am a big believer in visualization. I, I, I sort of took a, I call it a Polaroid picture of where I wanted to be. And when I was in my late 20s, I saw myself on the Oprah Winfrey show. That was my Polaroid picture. I don't know where you want to be or what, you know, what, where you're headed, but I really, I really feel like you should see it first. And maybe you're sitting at a table with world leaders, maybe you're driving a certain car, maybe you have certain flexibility in your life from, from an hour standpoint, whatever it is. For me, I was sitting on the stage with Oprah, and for the next 10 to 15 years of my life, it felt like I was filling in the blanks. I was really curious what I was talking to Oprah about, and I couldn't wait to find out, because I saw myself there, and we were talking, and I, and I remember always thinking, what, what are we talking about? I can't wait to figure this out. And if anyone had come up and whispered to me, it's footless pantyhose, I, I would have said, you're crazy. The other thing that I did is I didn't tell anybody my idea for one whole year, and it's very important to tell the people that can help move your idea forward but I didn't share it for validation purposes, and no one had shared that with me. It was sort of a gut feeling. But one, you know, ideas are the most vulnerable in their infancy, the moment you have them. And this is the moment that we always want to turn to a friend, a coworker, a husband, and tell somebody the idea. 
Well, the minute you tell somebody the idea, ego has to get involved. And then you end up spending all of your time defending it and explaining it rather than pursuing it. So I feel like more than anything, the reason why I'm not still selling fax machines is because I kept it a secret for one whole year. And all my friends and family can tell you, all, all I would ever, they would say is, Sarah's working on some crazy invention. We don't know what it is. And after one year, I sat them all down. I said, OK, guys, it's footless pantyhose. <laughs> I mean, you should have seen their faces. Like, what? And out of love and concern, I heard, you know, if it's such a good idea, why hasn't somebody else done it? And sweetie, if it is such a good idea, you'd use your life savings, and the big guys might knock you out of the water in six months. And until I'd invested this much of myself in this, I think if I had heard that a year ago when I cut the feet out of my pantyhose that day, I'd still be selling fax machines. I also am, uh, I, I, I was given a gift by my father on not being afraid to fail. So I think failure and your attitude and the way that you embrace the fear of failure is a big part of where we end up in our lives. And my father used to, at the dining room table, ask my brother and me what we failed at. And he used to encourage us to fail. So I can remember being at the dining room table, and he would say, Sarah, would you fail at this week? And if I didn't have something to tell him, he'd be disappointed. And I can remember coming home and sitting at the dining room table and saying, Dad, Dad, I tried out for this and I was horrible. And he would say, way to go, and high five me. <laughs> and those teachings and that, that principle that was such a gift for me as a child actually came from Wayne Dyer. My dad had been listening to a series called um, What Do You Really Want for Your Children? And so I got the benefit and so did my brother of this sort of different way of parenting and thinking. And for me, it redefined failure. Failure was no longer, for me, the outcome. Failure was not trying. So that was a very big gift for me. In closing, I'm going to leave you with a global expansion story. Uh, as you heard in the video, Spanx is in 40 countries, which is so unbelievable. I have the most amazing team now, and they are beyond amazing. Uh, the one common denominator, we have about 120 employees, and 110 of them, I think, are women. And they're all... <laughs> they are... The common theme is you, if you ever meet a Spanx employee, they will be very kind. We always just, we have the kindest people. They're smart, strategic women, out of the box, creative. And of course, we have a few good men that are really pulling their weight too and making a difference. And I hired a CEO two years into it that made a very big difference for the business. I always tell people, as soon as you can afford to hire your weaknesses, do it. So two years on the road, I saw my limitations, what I liked doing, what I didn't like doing, what I was good at, what I wasn't good at. And I brought her on, and that really moved the company forward and let me focus on the creative side and the sales and the marketing. But for our global expansion, it had to start somewhere. So it started with me jumping on a plane, flying to London with my lucky red backpack. I cold called Harrods, Harvey Nicks, Selfridges, and Fenix. And I got a chance to be on the BBC, which is sort of, you know, Europe CNN. And the guy right before he starts, he goes, so, so uh, you know, million people, no, no pressure. <laughs> I was so nervous, and he started out, and he goes, so Sarah, tell us what Spanx can do for women in the UK. <laughs> well, I smiled, and I said, well, it's all about the fanny. It smooths your fanny. It lifts and separates your fanny. <laughs> well, this man lost all the color in his face. And unbeknownst to me, I had no idea, but apparently fanny means vagina in England. <laughs> Great, right? So I had to call my team of three back at my apartment and say, our international expansion is off to a great start. <laughs> In closing, I'm leaving everybody with a gift. You have a gift card in your bag. Spanx doesn't ever um, discount, but whenever I give speeches as a gift to the women and the men who've been in the room, uh, you will get a coupon or something, I believe it is, in your bag that's $50 off of any Spanx item you want. 
As Star Jones mentioned, we have bras. It's, they're so comfortable. Bralleluia, swimwear. We just launched activewear. So you're, we have the whole bagel buster in the yoga pant that looks really good as you're running around town. And as you're getting in shape, you look even more like you're in shape. It's awesome. Um, and the swimwear. We got so many requests from you that you wanted to wear your Spanx to the beach. And we could not bear the thought of those tan lines. So we, we thought we got to do something about it. We put Spanx inside the swimsuit. And when you're going to Spanx.com, I just want to remind you, please spell it with an X or you're going to get a real treat, okay? 